Cool. All right. So we're now at, the, at I suppose, at a really important juncture. We spent last week looking at cardiovascular responses, and, and, and we said how important that was to our understanding of oxygen consumption. And we kind of saw that again in that paper that you read with some of those questions where we looked at the association between oxygen consumption and heart rate and cardiac output. But the big variable, the big variable that, that sits almost behind all of this is the fact that what we're doing is we are moving <coughs> oxygen. And we're moving that through the circulation. And we talked a little bit last week about the idea of, of peripheral resistance and the idea that we get a redirection of blood flow. So before we can actually start looking, <clears throat> before we start looking at actual exercise testing, which I suppose is where we, we really hit that next week, we've got to do a, a, a really important step-off point, which is in terms of understanding the hematology. And I would argue that don't just view this as, well, this is just background physiology. This is actually a really important exercise test in itself. If you're assessing somebody's maximal oxygen uptake, their VO2 max, for example, and the VO2 max looks abnormal, then the first thing to think about is, well, what's triggering the abnormality? Have a look at the oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. Are they suffering, for example, as we're going to look at today, from, a, from an anemia? So we have a great example. I may have mentioned this to you before, but one of the guys who used to test, Paralympic athlete, came in, VO2 max in the 80s, came in again, VO2 max in the 60s, that was only within eight weeks. That doesn't happen in somebody who's trained full time. We run a simple blood test, we look at the haemoglobin concentration, haemoglobin, because haemoglobin, as we're going to look at in a moment, has got a large iron component, haemoglobin con concentration fallen about by about 5% which corresponds to roughly the same difference in the form of the VO2 max. Put it on a course of iron supplementation, the VO2 max bounces back within about four weeks. Had we not known that, you'd have misdiagnosed what the VO2 max decrease was, was about, and we'd have been pushing the athlete down a very, very inappropriate road. So it serves two purposes. So we're going to spend today really looking at the background in terms of hematology, but also why we assess it and how we assess it to a certain degree. And it, what's fascinating in many ways is that now you can get almost well, all of these variables through capillarized blood. You don't even need large samples that you get when you go to the GPs. So when the GP takes that large sample, which feels like taking an arm full, you don't need that. You can actually get it all in capillary blood. Okay. So, <coughs> Do that. There we go. So, in the session today, we're going to start off looking at the composition of the blood. Now, yes, you did this last year. Okay, but my suspicion is that most of you have forgotten it. Um, and then we've got to look at the structures that are involved. <clears throat> because, again, if we are going to start to build a physiological picture of aerobic endurance, which is what we're doing in this semester, then we need to know why my laptop's doing that. Um, we need to start to think about the way in which we build this as a whole jigsaw. So it's about putting the pieces in. Then we're going to look at blood volume and concentration, how they can be affected by aerobic exercise. Because in essence, that's what we're, we're, we're getting at. We're, we are thinking about the aerobic capability of somebody. And so aerobic capability is related to things like yeah, cardiac outputs and heart rates and stroke volumes. But it's also a function of blood volume and then the fact that the variables that sit within that blood volume. And then we're going to think about norm values. <coughs> because your lifeblood are norm values. You have to be able to quote norm values. You would not expect to go to your GP or go and see a doctor and they take a glucose score, you say, is that good? And they go, I don't know. It's the same for you. 
If you're going to work in this field as an applied scientist, you've got to know your values. Come on, don't look them up. These are, this is kind of bread and butter. Normal values for hemoglobin. Normal values for hematocrit as an example. It should roll off your tongue. You need to have normal values for everything. And that's a bit of a hint in terms of the viva. The one thing I will be picking you up on are things like normal values. Okay. Absolutely essential. It's facts. Facts are fundamental. So unless you know the facts, you cannot even apply any, any idea of critical analysis that we, we often push you for. Okay. So where does that journey begin? Well, it begins again with the slide that I showed you last week. As I explained last week, Rajiv and Carl Bassaman, updated here by Andrew Jones and Dave Paul. We're interested in the oxygen consumption as measured, measured at the mouth. What we're saying is what goes on at the mouth reflects what is going on at the muscle. And what you're seeing here through these processes, through these interactions of the respiratory, cardiovascular, and muscular, are the cogs in terms of the movement of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. And we're moving that blood on a supply and demand process. If the demand goes up at the muscle for oxygen, because let's say we engage exercise, we put the uh, participant under stress, because that's what we do when we apply an exercise condition, we get a change in peripheral resistance, we get a redirection of blood flow, but we are moving the oxygenated blood to the site where it's required, because we need to oxygenate the muscle, because it's changing length, and we then got to remove the deoxygenated blood, because we need to take the carbon dioxide primarily away from the cell. And we'll come back to the carbon dioxide later in this semester. So that's a significant role in some of the exercise tests that we can, that we can perform. So the idea of not covering hematology would be very much like having that jigsaw piece missing. Because it is absolutely fundamental to what we do. So when you think about exercising today, and you've got your participant on the bike, and you see the heart rate going up, you see the oxygen consumption going up. Heart rate and oxygen consumption are a reflection of what is going on in the muscle. But all they are doing is really allowing us to shift more O2 saturated blood to the cell that's being engaged. That's all it is. That's all we're looking at. So fairly simple. Let's go back. All right, so if we take whole blood, um, we take a, a standard whole blood sample, and you're going to collect it, say, in, in capillary, or even if you collect um, a vein capture, the whole blood doesn't look like, it doesn't look particularly interesting to us um, until we spin the blood down. Okay, so if you spin the blood down, this is the level of Dan's animation technique. Um, that's what you're left with in the sedentary population. Okay, so there are going to be variations on that theme. So we've got plasma, which is, as you can see, about 55% of whole blood, and I don't like why it's doing this. It's getting very annoying. Platelets, and then we've got the erythrocytes. So erythrocytes are red blood cells. Plasma is the aqueous fluid that you see when you split blood. So when you split it, the heavier cells fall to the bottom, those are your red blood cells. What you're left with is the aqueous fluid, and it's almost straw-like in colour. Sitting between the two, you've got the platelets, and then actually sitting above the platelets and between the plasma, you've got a layer, which I think has got a great name. It's called a buffy layer. But it sits between the two. <coughs> So I want to know, looking at that, if you looked at that blood there, what would you say the hematocrit score is? 
<coughs> Bearing in mind you studied Hematocrit last year. Let's go back. What is hematocrit? <coughs> How much is something in the blood? How much of uh, the components in the blood? Which components? All three of the components. No, not all three. <laughs> not the plasma. Red blood cells. Hematocrit is the amount of red blood cells within the whole blood. So what's the hematocrit score? Forty-five percent. And so we've automatically got an index when we spin it down of, of the ratio <coughs> of whole blood to plasma. We know that we have different scores for males and females in terms of, of plasma. Not plasma, sorry. In terms of hematocrit. So the females, we have a hematocrit score of about 38 to 42% in um, the general population, about 38 to 42. For the male, it's about 42 to 46 percent. 38, 42, female, 42, 46 for male. If I increase my erythrocytes, I increase the red blood cell count, what happens to the plasma score? It, it decreases because we're taking this within a whole sample. This is based upon 100 milliliters of blood. So if you increase red blood cell count, you decrease plasma, what happens to the viscosity of the blood? It gets thicker. Exactly. And I spoke to you a little bit about this last year when I was talking to you about the idea of um, cyclists who die from taking <laughs> EPO because the blood becomes so thick that the, the circulatory system can't move it around the, the body. What is an, another way that we can increase the hematocrit score, aside from training? Apart, yeah, okay, apart from doping as well. We'll, we'll take doping out. Really obvious one. A lot of you probably altitude. Altitude. Or just altitude exposure, not even training. Um, you've only got to be exposed... You've only got to be exposed to altitude. That's an altitude in excess of 1,500 metres. In excess of 1,500 metres above sea level, you start to see increases in hematocrit score. And in fact, the data from Pikes Peak in the USA from Greg Levine's group demonstrated increases in hematocrit with, within six hours of exposure. Six hours of exposure. And it gets more startling when you look at their data, it shows a 300% increase in red blood cell count within six hours of exposure. 300%. You don't retain that. It's a shock response to, to the um, hypobaric environment. But nonetheless, it shows how this actually has quite significant variability, both maybe on a chronic exposure at altitude, but also with an acute response. What do you think would be another way of changing somebody's hematocrit, but without going to altitude, without doping, without training? Notice I've asked the question slightly differently. I'm not interested in changing the red blood cells. How do you change the hematocrit without training? Without altitude, not iron. Not iron. Chronic dehydration. If you chronically dehydrate somebody, this doesn't change in terms of the numbers. This decreases, so the ratio of the erythrocytes to the plasma goes up. The blood becomes more viscous. So one of the big things to be aware of when you're looking at hematocrit scores are training status, previous altitude exposure, and hydration status. 
In fact, you can use hematocrit as a proxy measure of hydration status. And in fact, we published a study, I published a study about that, four years ago, where we took half a litre of blood out of people and made them re-exercise. And we got into an argument in the literature, it's great, I love getting into arguments in the literature, with um, Mark Burnley's group, who, who was down at Aboriginal at the time, because they've done something similar, but they showed um, a very, very different result. Why? They haven't controlled for hydration status. If you take half a litre of blood out of somebody, I've taken out a load of fluid content. So unless I allow you to rehydrate, I'm already making your blood more viscous. So it's incredibly important that when we're thinking about hematocrit scores, don't just think about this component here, which is just the red blood cell count. Think very much about what's, what's affecting the, the plasma concentration. So when we are collecting blood, whole blood, we are interested in erythrocytes, we are interested in plasma, but we're also interested in the, the factors that contribute to the erythrocyte count and the erythrocyte function. So we're interested in things like the hemoglobin concentration, the hemoglobin sitting on the red blood cell. Okay. <clears throat> 